Okay, so we're recording. Welcome everybody. Um, welcome to this week's our seminar. Um, so if you haven't come to one of these before, the way it works is the talk will last for around 45 minutes, after which there'll be questions. And also if you're interested, um, Dale has agreed to stay after the talk if anybody wants to stay and discuss. Um, during the talk itself, we do encourage questions. Um, so if you want to ask a question, just remember that you'll be recorded. If you want to write, write, um, ask a question, either write a message to me directly in chat or raise your hand, which I'll be able to see in the participants menu. Um, after the question session, I'll turn the camera off. And then if you want to ask further questions, um, you won't be recorded. Um, but without further, further <clears throat> without further ado, um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Del Mira. No, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Delighted to have an invitation to speak to this group. And what I'll speak about today, uh, so, so, sort of a high level talk, but a, a proof theory for model checking. Uh, this is based on um, some work I did and we published in the Journal of Automated Reasoning with a, a student, uh, Kenton Heath. You can find my slides and the pointer to this paper uh, on the OWL's website. If, if you look under the abstract link, you'll find both of them there already. <clears throat> okay, historically speaking, model checking was introduced in the early 1980s as a way to establish properties about programs. In a certain sense, it was a reaction to the fact that it was very hard to prove theorems about programs, say using the Floyd and Hoare method, especially when you're doing concurrency. Uh, so in response to the fact it was so hard to prove, it was thought, well, let's at least try to find counterexamples to uh, conjectures. Look around a lot for counterexamples if possible. So you would look for states uh, could, could a system make a transition where you were in the critical section twice, for example? Uh, so this was uh, one of the motivations for model checking. And right there in the, in the title, model checking and theorem proving, there's these differences. One is in, interested in, say, dealing with the semantics or a model, and the other one is dealing with proofs, a very syntactic thing. Uh, but I'll argue in this talk that, in fact, model checking can, in fact, be given a very appealing proof theory foundation, and I'll describe some of it. Um, the proof theory ingredients I'll talk about at a high level are mostly these. Uh, we start with Ganson sequence calculus. Uh, Girard's linear logic plays an important role. Uh, towards the end of the talk, focusing uh, proof systems will be important, and this will be based on Andreoli's notion of focusing, but our results go beyond that because we've added things to linear logic he didn't address. Uh, and there was a certain treatment of fixed points and equality, first order structure in logic that uh, we're taking from Schroeder, Heister, and Girard. They had a treatment of this back in the 1991 and 92 independently. And we make a lot of use of that in the logic I'll speak about. And then there's been other advances and uh, on this kind of approach to say fixed point, uh, maybe we should say arithmetic versus logic. And so I list some authors that I've worked with on this topic. And I note that all the developments except for the first came after the start of model checking. So we'll bring most of these topics to bear when talking about the proof theory of model checking. First of all, why promote uh, proof theory? Well, uh, one way, one reason is if you've done model checking uh, and you think of it as proofs, well, proofs are finite objects almost always, and they can pre you can then use this to provide notions of certificates for independent checking, if you will, uh, for model checking. It also provides a way of integrating model checking and inductive theorem proving because they're going to work on the same logics and proof structures, presumably. You can also generalize once you're in model, once you move from model checking to uh, proof theory, proof theory has a lot of ways to uh, deal with complicated linguistic structures, even those including bindings. So it would be, it, it has been possible to take some of these model checking ideas and move them to talk about uh, systems like the lambda calculus or the pi calculus. And years ago, I worked on giving a proof theory foundation for logic programming. It's a long time ago now, but it, it, it proved of some value to have done that. 
And so I think just in, as a natural thing to try, let's see if we can do this something similar with model checking. Now, this slide is meant for the experts in lo uh, linear logic. I, am, uh, I will introduce what I think I need of linear logic in a minute, but just a quick synopsis for those of you who are actually are experts, otherwise you can ignore this. Um, mal, multiplicative additive linear logic is a propositional logic, of course, without contraction and weakening. The connectives are often written with these uh, rather odd looking symbols here for the now. And it is a decidable logic. You can move away, um, you can make mal more expressive and usually in two ways. Girard proposed adding the exponentials to linear logic as a way of uh, reintroducing contraction and weakening at least on selected formulas. And, uh, but there's another approach, uh, David Bald and I in uh, 2007 proposed adding fixed points and other first order logic structure to get a system we might call, let's say, mu mall. So there are no exponentials in, in mu mall, but there are fixed points. And it is this uh, that I propose as a better foundations for model checking. And again, for the expert, notice that uh, it's not too surprising that you get unbounded behavior in LGF fixed points, of course. You're reintroducing something like contraction. So you take a fixed point down here, mu of b with some arguments, uh, would unfold or would mean the same as b applied to mu b. So you, you take one instance of b on the left, and now you have two instances of b on the right. So while that's not contraction, it is a kind of copy. And that'll be a principle that we use a lot in this logic. And one other thing, if you're familiar with the notion of polarization and positive and versus negative, if a formula B is purely positive in linear logic, you can prove it's equivalent to its own exponential. Okay, in the mall setting, there are almost no formulas that satisfy this um, purely positive restriction. But in the mu mall setting, you get a highly, a very rich collection of such formulas. So. Um, the difference between being linear or being nonlinear, if you will, can be, uh, you can play with that by, by having things that are purely positive or a mixture of positive and negative connectives. Okay, so that was for the experts. I'll give you a quick run in. Now, uh, starting from first principles, however, let's say, uh, what is an additive inference rule? Well, uh, if you know some examples, you go, oh, they look like the rules for uh, true and false. For sort of, if you're gonna to try to come up with a proof theory mode uh, attachment to uh, model theory, then the additive connectives seem very natural for that. So let's just try to stick with additive inference rules if we can. Now, what is an additive inference rule? Well, I'm not gonna give a definition. In linear logic, there are examples of additive inference rules. Hintika provides a game treatment for a uh, you know, two-player game for classical conjunction and disjunction and so, and so on. That looks very additive as well. That's an example. Uh, if you have sequent calculus, then uh, if you don't have many formulas in a sequent, in other words, you, you don't have a comma, for example, then that seems to be central to what additive is as well. So instead of trying to give a definition, let me give an example in some high level principles. So let's go, let's take this straight from, well, uh, usual a treat, sequent calculus treatment of the propositional connectives. So just consider conjunction, it's unit true, and disjunction, it's unit false, and no other, no other propositional sim, uh, symbols. So this is a very weak logic, of course. But here's the proof system. These would be the additive proof rules here. Okay, so to prove an and, you prove both uh, B1 and B2 as premises, and the side formula stay the same in, in the premise and conclusion. True would be the degenerate form of the zero area version of that. Here is the rule for or, you, you have to prove one or the other. There is no rule for false. There's no introduction rule for false on the right. And there are these De Morgan dualities, the obvious ones between true and false and 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 or. And when I write a negation, I don't mean a logical connective. I mean, uh, take the formula B and replace every connective with the, the Morgan dual. Uh, and I'll say that a multiset of A formulas is provable if, uh, and I'll write it this way with the turnstile there using those inference rules. 
Okay, so a very weak system, but it's clearly additive in the usual sense of that. And what theorems do we have for additive connectives? Well, these are really trivial things to write, but it, it sort of gets to the heart of it, I think. So if I have a, two multisets of A formulas and a B, which is a, a formula, then we have a strengthening theorem. This is the main, uh, main interesting one. If, if I can prove a multiset, that it has a proof, then there is a, there is a formula in that multiset which is provable itself, and that's sort of the key. In other words, uh, having a context doesn't help you. <laughs> in other words, if there's a context and there's a proof, then there's in that context there is this formula. There is a formula that can be just can be proved on its own, without con without the context. So that's a real strengthening result, if you will. Weakening contraction is kind of immediate here. That if you have one context bigger than the other and you prove the weaker one and you prove the stronger one. Um, might as well stay it this way. The initial rule is provable. P or uh, and with not P in the sequence, that's provable. And uh, the kind of missibility holds as well. So if you have your proof of B with one context and not B with the other context, then you can cut away the B for, two, for the joining of those two contexts. Uh, if you have these properties, then one reason I'd argue this is like semantics is you get a truth table evaluation very immediately and simply. So for example, if I define uh, the value of a uh, uh, formula A is either true or false, depending on if I can prove it, then it's true. If I, if I can prove its negation, then it's false. So this is proof in both, uh, both uh, sides. And if I make that definition, then the, the admissibility of the initial rule implies that this evaluation is total. And the admissibility of cut implies it's functional. So I can't give something true and false at the same time. And if you go through the introduction rules, you can see, you can write down a truth table for all the connected and and or true and false. Okay. So the connection to added, uh, additive rules and truth functionality in this case is rather apparent and immediate. Okay. Of course, the logic here is very weak. So let's try to strengthen this logic with, let's say at least first order terms and, and quantification. So uh, term equality and equal, uh, quantification. So let's just do a very simple thing. We, we have a, a sig signature for building a construct for constructing natural numbers and maybe other structures. Uh, so sigma, uh, a sigma term is anything built from the constructors and sigma. Right now, everything is closed. There's no variables. Uh, so I give an example of some sigma terms. And now the, the inference rules for equality would be the following. If, if T is a closed term, then T equals T with any side form, it would be provable. And if T and S differ as terms, then saying T is not equal to, uh, uh, these two terms are not equal to each other is also similarly provable. So that's kind of obvious. And then the quantifier rules, uh, let's state them clearly. So uh, to prove an existential, you prove an instance of it, okay? And to prove a universal, then you must prove every instance of it you know, for every term T. All right, so that's an odd rule. Well, that's, it has a name, it's the mega rule, infinitary rule. And I'd argue that all these rules are still additive, but there's a cost to doing this, and that is uh, you have to be infinitary. Presumably there's an infinite number of terms, for example, of sigma terms. So you can, if you continue this route of staying additive, then you have to go infinitary, I suspect. That's the right conclusion. But even worse than that, or, or, or probably because of that, there's really no algorithm here for proof search, if you will. And I'll illustrate that here. So let's assume we have zero and successor uh, in my signature. I have uh, these numbers, uh, piano uh, numerals, I'll write as boldface zero, one, two, three, for example. And now let's take uh, two sets. Uh, A will be the set containing zero, one, B the set zero, one, two. So I can write as, let's say, lambda expression or just a, a, a comprehension axiom uh, expression. So A would be this disjunction of two equations and uh, B would be this disjunction of three equations. 
And I'd like to prove that A is a subset of B. That's a typical thing you'd want to do in a model checker. Um, so that would be denoted by this universally quantified disjunction with the negation or equivalent to the formula I have here. Okay, I, I want to prove that for all x, x is not zero and x is not equal to one or x is zero and x is one. Okay, you see the whole formula there. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, to prove this requires me to prove an infinite number of premises, one for every natural number. And I need to validate that that disjunction down here is provable for every instance of, the, of t. Now, in fact, it's true. But it's, let's say, not algorithmic in any natural sense, this, uh, this approach. All right, so about the, so I, I think we reached the dead end quickly of what we can do with additive connectors in, in any sort of expressive setting here. So we're going to complete the picture by adding back multiplicative inference rules. That's the other choice. I'll illustrate that in a moment. And then we'll have to introduce an, the notion of focusing proof system. And we do that because it, it provides us a formal mechanism to define what we might call synthetic inference rules. In other words, big step inference rules. The rules Genson gave us and Girard gave us, these are, you know, introduction rules are very tiny little things. Uh, focusing allows us to organize these tiny little things into big step rules. And we'll call them synthetic rules. And it's a, it's a whole device for producing such synthetic rules. Then we'll define what we mean by additive synthetic rules. Okay, so inside an additive synthetic rule, we will allow multiplicative behavior. But when you take a step back and look at the main inference rule itself, the one that's constructed this way, it looks additive. And that would be the natural extension. That would be where I would place model checking more generally in this setting. Uh, then I define a technical thing called switchable formulas, and we can prove that whenever you have switchable formulas, you only have these additive synthetic rules. Okay, and the conclusion for the talk will then be the proof theory of switchable formulas in linear logic provides a, a, a nice foundations for model checking. So the rest of the talk is going to highlight these points. So let's start with, um, what do I mean by multiplicative? So let's look at the implication there's two ways to treat unification uh, typically. One is uh, often called material implication. And you get these two introduction rules, say, on the right, which are very uh, non unsatisfactory. And classical logic, it works, but it's still, let's say, unsatisfactory. But we know we can do this. Um, however, what Genson did is introduced a two-sided sequence and wrote down a much more familiar rule using hypothetical reasoning. And this is an example of a multiplicative rule. Um, and that is, notice here that context now matter. So for example, to understand A implies B, I have to have, I, I continue to have a relationship between A on the left and B on the right. And if I put everything on the right, they'd still both be present in the sequence. And contexts are essential. And for example, the strengthening theorem no longer holds. So this is provable in Genson's uh, uh, treatment of implication, this sequence, you, and you have P on both sides. Uh, but th so this latter formula is provable, but neither formula alone is provable. Okay, so you can't apply the validation strategy, the naive one that I showed earlier directly here. So that's an example of non-additive behavior, and this is typically called a multiplicative inference rule. All right. Uh, so more directly, we have implication and, and conjunction go to, together. We, so here's the additive rule, I mean, I'm sorry, the multiplicative rules. These are the rules essentially as Genson has written them. Uh, there is an implication on the right, that's the familiar um, hypothetical treatment. And here is the uh, say multiplicative rule for implication left. So notice that the side formulas, gamma one, delta one, gamma two, delta two, accumulate in the conclusion. They're, they're not the same. What's in the conclusion is not the same in the premises. So there's an accumulation going on. That's another aspect of multiplicative. Uh, because we have this curry-uncurry uh, connection, it's clear that there is a multiplicative conjunction here. And this is uh, the multiplicative conjunction. Uh, 
And I note this is not the one, say, Genson wrote in his original paper. He had the mold. He chose between the additive and multiplicative version of conjunction. He chose the additive one only. But there is this one. And if you're familiar with linear logic, this is also called the tensor. Uh, and for symmetry, I'm going to rename the conjunction we've seen so far, which has been the additive one, as n minus. So the minus and plus will become relevant later. But let's just say I have one that's called n plus, now one that's called n minus. And there's also a corresponding notion of true plus and uh, true minus. And in linear logic, if I wanted to, I would write, uh, instead of writing these, let's say, uh, classical looking con uh, connectors that we would have written these uh, other symbols here. And when we uh, talk implication in this, uh, in these slides, I'm actually going to be speaking of the linear implication, although I won't write linear implication much. It corresponds to that. Okay, and just for those who, who care, uh, the multiplicative false is actually present in this system because it's actually definable as the inequality of two uh, when of two terms being uh, which are actually equal. So it is a false statement, but of the multiplicative kind. Okay, so multiplicative connectors. And there's another layer here of multiplicative, and that is with the quantifiers. So I showed the additive version earlier. Uh, Genson's treatment of the quantifiers was actually what I would call the multiplicative one. In other words, he used variables and eigenvariables in particular to treat uh, these inference rules. They were part of his proof system. So let's, let's let script X be first order, a set of first order variables. Um, sigma of X denotes all terms you built from the constructors and sigma and the variables. Uh, sequence now will have a, another thing on the left. It'll, so I'll have basically the two-sided sequence with the script X on the left as well. And that's where I will be putting the um, the eigenvariables of the proof that are bound over the sequence. So I think of these X's as having a binding there across all these formulas. So these formulas are allowed to mention X inside them, okay? And now the inference rules here would be the following. Uh, now I have this X on my sequence and uh, the term that I instantiate here is not just some closed term, it's a term that's uh, essentially a sigma x term. It can have the x variables free in it at this point. And the universal on the right uh, is a way of introducing a new bound variable. So I now have the y here. So y cannot have appeared already in x, so now it's a new occurrence here. And I use that instance here. And another way to think about it is this binding here, X, becomes this binding here, Y. It's a kind of movement of a binder. It never becomes free. Here it's bound in a formula. Here it's bound around the sequence. It stays bound. So I would argue that these are the, first, these are the multiplicative treatments of quantifiers. And again, notice what multiplicative often means is that uh, I have a relationship between two things in the sequence, in this case, uh, quantified formula and uh, the context of variables. Now we have to extend equality to open terms. So this, uh, this can be done. It's well known to be like this. Um, if T and S are terms with possible variables in them, and it's not, they're not unifiable, then we have the, this, these two rules. So if I'm, if I'm assuming T equals S and they're not unifiable, that's a false statement. So that sequence is now proved because that's false. And, and this sequence would be true because, okay, we know T is not, can never be equal to S. So we're willing to say that's provable. And if they are unifiable with a most general unifier theta, then we can take away the T minus equals S on the bottom and replace it by instantiating everything everywhere uh, on the premise with theta, okay? So in the end, you know, this is, this is the case, uh, it holds if X is equal to S of Z, okay? And then what you do is you can remove that whole thing and just replace X everywhere with S of Z, if you will. And it's, just, it's the same sort of rule when you have the negation on the right-hand side, all right. Um, technically, the 
what I mean by this is uh, I, I remove all the variables from X that was in the domain of theta and add all free variables that are in the co-domain. So all new variables, the variables I'm replacing are removed from X and anything I'm inserting in, I, I put back in, in the bin there. And so this treatment of equality goes back to, uh, like I mentioned earlier, Schroeder, Heister, and Girard back in the 1990s and 92. And it's essentially attaching unification as a black box to the sequent calculus, okay? It's part of now the sequent calculus. When Genson wrote his, his rules, there was no unification, even if theorem provers implementing Genson systems used unification, it was not part of the inference rule. Now unification is part of the inference rule. Um, we have experience in, uh, with using proof systems and doing proof search uh, in logics with exactly these kinds of inference rules. In fact, we have, I'll mention a little later, a system called Bedver and another one called Abella, which do these things in computations. Now we can return to this problem of uh, subset relationship. Let's say I now wanna have a, a proof, I wanna have a proof of A is a subset of B, same A and B as I had before. And now I, I wanna prove this theorem uh, statement down here. For every x, x is equal to zero or one implies x equals zero, one or two. So it's all pretty trivial, but now we can build a finite proof of this trivial th thing. And it is in fact a trivial proof. So how, how does this work? The first two steps would be for all introduction on the right and implication of the introduction on the right. So the for all introduction introduces a new eigenvariable that's here. And the implication introduces a new assumption that goes from here to here. And now we have to prove under that assumption, this uh, right-hand side holds. Well, this is a case analysis. So there's no reason why I shouldn't just set up the cases. So in one case, it's X equals zero. In the other case, it's X equals one. Now that I have X equals zero on the left-hand side, I would do a unification of X and zero. Well, that's trivial, it just says x should equal zero. So you go from this line to the one above by replacing x everywhere, these three occurrences with zero. And then you can finish the proof because uh, of that disjunction, you know, this disjunction is provable. Similarly, over here, I have a case x equals one. You treat that, it's removed by a unification. And I know that this uh, disjunct is provable. So now I have a finitary proof. Uh, it's not the infinitary one. It's a very natural finitary proof. And in fact, it's sort of uh, a typical thing you'd expect to be doing in model checking. And you're only dealing with those terms you can reach from A. In other words, A describes the cases, the only cases you need to consider and you consider those. So that is now finitary. Uh, we also need fixed points. So, um, and here I'll use mu and nu for least and greatest fixed points. However, in this talk, the difference between least and greatest is, uh, I should really call them both generic fixed points. I'm not going to have a least, I'm not going to axiomatize least fixed points with induction and greatest fixed points with co-induction. We have studied the proof theory for that, but in this talk, I'll just think of them as uh, operators which unfold, both of them, okay. So in fact, they don't differ. The reason I have two is one is positive and one is negative in the sense of uh, putting a plus symbol and a negative symbol on a connective. We'll see that in a few minutes. So the inference rules for them are just straightforward. If I ever run into a new or a mu in a context, I just unfold, okay? So here I have the least fixed point of B with some arguments is expands to B applied to the least fixed point of B and those same arguments. And I do that on the left and I do that on the right. So it's a very simple treatment of, um, of fixed points for right now. It does correspond a lot to some of the things you do in model checking where you do finite state exp uh, exploration. You just keep unfolding. <clears throat> And let's do a kind of concrete example. Let's take a prologue specification of a very tiny graph, which I'll call steps. So there's an arrow from A to B, from B to C, and finally from uh, C to B. And then I talk about the transitive closure of step, I'll call it path. So I can get, there's a path from X to Y if there's a step, and there's a path if there's a step, and then that's followed by a, a path. So it's a recursive definition here. So I can write step as a least fixed point expression, that's this one, 
And notice the, the recursive call A is not free here. That's not surprising, right? It's not a recursive definition, but I can write it this way with the or and 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 equations. So it should be clear. And path can be written as this um, uh, least fixed point ex expression. This time the predicate A is recalled recursively. So this will be the path calling itself uh, path. And so it's either a step or there exists some intermediate step in the recursive call. Now, I'll soon have to talk about focusing terminology. So I introduced the notion of a positive connective. So I just list them here. So equality uh, and positive and plus or an existential and the least fixed point operator will call uh, positive connectives. And the dual, the, the Morgan dual of these will be the negative connectives. And as this il example illustrates, Anything I can write in prologue, pure prologue, in other words, in horn clauses, is actually a purely positive fixed point. Purely positive means I use no other connectives than positive connectives in the description of the entire fixed point. Okay, so that's uh, that'll be real important soon. So, horn clause, prolo pure prologue, and positive fixed points are essentially the same thing. All right, let's see about some examples. Uh, reachability proof. So can I prove there's a step from A to C? Well, if you remember the graph, there isn't one. So if I start to try to find a proof, I have to try, you know, I just unfold the mu expression that step is, I get to this big or, and there's no way to prove either any one of these disjuncts, so it's a failure. So there isn't a proof. There is a proof that there's a path from A to C. So that, that's, you start trying to prove that, you unfold, you get this big disjunction, and then you choose the, the right disjunct, you add a, a, a bit of uh, knowledge, you would say this replaces B, uh, this uh, quantifier with B, and now prove that there's a step from A to B and that there's a path from B to C, okay? And well, you can continue this way, but it's kind of obvious now how it happens. So a reachability within a graph, can be achieved this way, right? Um, by proving path, and it's a natural looking proof. Non-reachability also exists. There are proofs for these things. So you can prove that uh, A is not as, uh, adjacent to C. So how? You do the unfolding this time on the left. There's nothing on the right. That's what the dot means. Um, now you have a big disjunction on the left, so you have three cases, this one, this one, and this one. And when you keep analyzing, you see, ah, C equals B on the left, that's a false statement. So this, this is now proved. If I have a false premise, it's proved. Uh, here is a, a, a false premise, so it's proved. And here's another false premise, so it's proved. Uh, both of them are false. Okay, so that's in fact the proof that there's no step from A to uh, C. Okay, that's kind of trivial, but um, uh, if you, I could start replacing this with path, and as long as the, the underlying graph has no cycles, then I can prove uh, that there is no path. I mean, the fact that there is no path can be proved by a finite structure. So this is essentially showing that negation is finite failure uh, yields immediately proof structures in this calculus. So that's another example of a model checking kind of question. Uh, Non-reachability proofs. Of course, most graphs, have, um, most interesting graphs have cycles. So there's another step to take there that involves induction. But let's just uh, say we have no cycles for the moment. Uh, here's some more examples. So I won't go into details. I'll just illustrate quickly that you can define uh, NAT, a predicate that holds of a, a structure if and only if it's a natural number. So that can be written as a least fixed point. It's either zero or it's, it's a successor of something which is a natural number. Plus, uh, okay, there's, I, you just take the prologue descriptions if you're familiar with prologue and you can write them as a, a fixed points this way using the Clark completion. And least, less than or equal can be written similarly as that. And this formula, uh, which essentially says plus is commutative. If I add N and M to get P, then M plus N is P. 
Now, the only way to prove this formula, it's provable, but I need induction. So I can't just sort of unfold fixed points to get this one. I need a slightly clever invariant for this. However, this formula can be proved by a model checker uh, using the logic I've just shown. So uh, for every n less than or equal to 10 and, and n less than or equal to 10, this uh, commutativity holds. So you'd essentially have 100 cases to analyze that each and each time it holds. Okay, so that's in the model checking setting. And you can do that by finite uh, uh, exploration of the uh, n proof search. Okay, now I need to get into a more technical subject. I wanna build synthetic inference rules now. And so the, for that, I need this notion of focusing. So let me, let, I have a couple slides here on this. Uh, negative connectives have invertible right rules. So of all the connectives, I, I, I highlighted the positive ones, but their De Morgan duals are called negative. And it happens that all the negative connectives have invertible right-hand rules. And the positive connectives generally don't have invertible uh, right-hand rules. It's, it's not strict, but uh, the, for the right, for the negatives, it's a strict invertibility. For the, uh, the, the positives, they, they may be invertible, but usually they're not invertible on the right. Now, sequence in the focus sitting will be a little variations of what we've seen already. We had the, the eigenvariables will stay here. The turnstile is in the middle, so it's a two-sided sequence but I'll have uh, these red arrows, sometimes two up arrows, and sometimes one down arrow on the left or one down arrow on the right, okay? Now, to a first approximation, replace the arrow by a comma and you get a, a regular sequence that we've seen already. But put the arrow in and what I'm saying is that the formulas between the arrow and the turnstile, if any, arrow and the turnstile are distinguished. These are the, these are the formulas here, and here and here where uh, introduction rules take place, nowhere else. And in fact, I'll call the side formulas, these Ns here and the Ps here, storage. This is the storage zone. And there's a certain moment where I'm, I'm looking at the formulas and saying, no, I'm not gonna work on this now. I, I put it in the storage, it becomes inactive for a moment. So that's what we'll mean by storage. It moves further away from the turnstile. In the focused, uh, in these down arrows rules, uh, the formula B, which is unique here, there could be several formulas uh, between these two arrows, uh, zero or many. Here with the focus setting, there's exactly one. So we talk of the focus of a sequent being the distinguished formula next to the down arrow. All right. Uh, and okay, so let's, let's move on. So now, <laughs> This, I don't want to talk about this in detail. I, I just want to illustrate what's going on. This is Genson style uh, sequence calculus, but some of the commas are in his system are replaced now with an up arrow. These are all up arrows here. So, and these are where I'm actually handling invertible rules. So for example, if I implement uh, a proof search and I have an up arrow here, I can just tell the system, just do the obvious rule. You'll never lose provability if you do these rules. And in fact, what focusing does is one thing is it says, do as much as you can of the invertible rules to exhaustion. Don't do anything clever, just apply these invertible rules when they apply and keep applying until they don't apply. So there's nothing interesting or clever going on here. It's just routine calculations sometimes of most general unification, right? Sometimes there's big substitutions to handle this fixed point uh, unfolding and other things, okay? But there's no insight into uh, proof going on here. The next, uh, I, so this finishes the proof system I have in mind here. I have a down arrow on these rules and sometimes I need clever information here. So down arrow on an existential right rule, so I must put in the right uh, correct term, T. And T means that, uh, so I'm suppressing sometimes the, um, the um, uh, here, the set of variables. If I don't need them explicitly, I don't write them, but they're always present. So of course, with the existential rule, this term must be a term that in, may involve the eigenvariables of the sequence. Uh, another example of a rule here. So I have an or, I have to have knowledge, should I go left 
pick the left disjunct or the right disjunct? Is I equal to one or is it equal to two? Some of the other rules don't seem very uh, non-invertible. They don't take much information. You just unfold if you see these things. In the fuller picture, when these are least and greatest fixed points, there is a difference, but uh, won't, I won't be illustrating it now. Okay, so notice all these rules at the top here have down arrows only. So the rules we've seen before are purely down arrow or purely up arrow. And now uh, we have uh, these three rules. So I mentioned that sometimes formulas will be made into storage formulas. So if I have a positive formula in an up arrow setting, so remember up arrow is when I'm doing um, invertible things, in other words, routine. But a positive formula might be, is a setting where, well, maybe it's not routine anymore. I have to be clever. So I'm going to put it aside and move it from this zone to that zone. And I store it for later consideration. So positive on the right, negative on the left is a dual behavior. They both move from the center to the outside. Over here, decide says, if I'm in the up arrow phase and I have processed all the invertible formulas possible, then I take from storage, I take an end formula from the left or a positive formula from the right. And now I have a focus. So I go from up arrows here to down arrow there. Up arrows here, the down arrows here. Okay. So that's uh, that rule shows us how I, I, I can switch from reading bottom up, up arrow to down arrow. And the release is the opposite of that. If I'm in the positive phase where I'm trying to do clever things and I get to a, a formula which is invertible, in other words, nothing clever, just do, the comp just do a computation on it, then I switch to that phase where I'm now asking to do routine computations. So if I'm on the right and a focus, but I get a negative formula, I switch to go to the upper L phase and duly for the left-hand side. Okay. <clears throat> Now I have sequence, I can now describe synthetic inference rules. And these will be rules of this form. Uh, first of all, I have border sequence. So whenever I have up arrows with nothing to process in the middle, I call that the border of, a, of what's essentially be a synthetic rule. So a synthetic inference rule has such formulas at the bottom, such formulas at the top, and in between, I'll have these other little rules, but I, the, the goal is to think of the, the bottom to the top as the, um, the real connective, or the real inference rule. But in fact, I'll go one step further. I look at the storage formulas here. And whenever, the, the, when you union that, that up, you get a singleton, then we'll call that a singleton border uh, sequence. In other words, there's only one formula stored. In other words, in those kinds of sequence, I have exactly one formula on the left or exactly one formula on the right. I may or may not have variables associated. And those will be called singleton border sequence. Okay. And I'm getting there because this is, this is the additive nature of things, right? I don't want to have, I may have multiple formulas in the middle of a sequence, but on the borders, I really want to have only one formula. Okay, so this is the additive nature of things. All right. Synthetic inference rules for purely positive formulas. So if I restrict myself P to this grammar, in other words, these were the purely positive formulas. And if I, if I have a border sequence with a purely positive formula here, and I do a decide, all right, I move it in to be focused. I never come out of that focus. And uh, I, I only get a, a proof if I end, and the, I, I only end with an equation of, of a term equals to itself, okay? Uh, in the process, I may have to choose, do I go left or right at the disjunct? I have to uh, get a clever substitution for a variable. But in the end, it's, um, I never leave this phase. So if I down, uh, decide on a purely positive formula and I get a, I'm done, then that whole computation is in one phase, if you will, right? So the, uh, it's exactly one phase. So in fact, the prologue-like computation can be forced into one phase. So when I think of um, a synthetic inference rule 
as having possibly many rules inside before I get to the other side. It is very possible to have inside there an entire prolog computation. So that's interesting for at least two reasons. One is I can do arbitrary non-deterministic computations inside an inference rule. I don't have side conditions for this to happen. I have it right inside the rule. And the other thing is it's obviously, uh, it's a very general setting, that's nice, but it's also, I can't check. If someone claims I have a synthetic inference rule, I may not be able to decide on that because an arbitrary computation could be inside and I'd have to be checking that. But I, it's a very general framework, so I'm, I'm happy with uh, allowing that at this point. And now finally, what do I mean by additive synthetic connectives? Um, so uh, we need to restrict the occurrences of the multiplicative connectives. So remember, most things were additive, but we added implication and a positive conjunction, and they were multiplicative. So there is a slightly complicated rule here. Let's not worry about it too much. It just says whenever there is a multiplicative connective, one side of this connective has to be, let's say, purely positive. It's like a your guard, there's a computational guard on the rest of the formula, on the other part of the formula. So uh, it's not truly multiplicative because one of them will essentially be like a unit. I mean, you only know the unit by doing a, a very long computation, but it becomes like a unit and then it sort of disappears, the multiplicative connective. So there it's what it means here and, and implication, that's what it means there. And note that if I have a purely positive or purely negative formula, these are examples of switchable formulas. And I'll show a few more in a minute. Well, here's one. So let's do something else that's a typical example in model checking. Uh, let's talk about labeled, tra uh, labeled transition systems and the notion of simulation and bisimulation. So let this be, this notation PROAQ, be a typical labeled transition. So it's a, uh, it'll be there, the arrow is a predicate of three arguments. And I'm going to assume that this arrow of three arguments can be defined by a purely positive expression. So for example, when you do structured operational semantics on labeled transition systems, you write usually, at least in the beginning, you write simple prologue kinds of pr programs. Uh, let's not worry about adding negations at the premises and such things. But in many, many cases, these transition systems are just simple prolog-like programs. So that's a, a reasonable assumption to make at one point. Uh, okay, it turns out that both that formula and its negation are switchable formulas. And the following fixed points define simulation and bisimulation. So here I'm using the greatest fixed point because if I were to do this with uh, invariance, this would be uh, a negative connective actually and denoting the greatest fixed point. So it's a recursive uh, expression. So it says for every action and every continuation, P arrow A, if I can make an A step to P prime, then there exists a Q prime, which Q can make a step. And those two continuations still hold that same relationship. So this would be simulation. And by simulation would be essentially the same thing, but you write it twice, these two clauses twice, and there's a sort of symmetry between them. And I, I also like to point out that this is an example, the first time we've seen a one formula, one uh, uh, query, if you will, in which I have both the positive conjunction and the negative conjunction here, okay? And you can see that that's what's actually should be happening because if you look at, uh, say Colin Sterling's notion of game semantics, this, is, uh, this would match up exactly with his. Uh, so uh, the, the following theorem, I'll end in just a moment here, is that if we have uh, only switchable formulas uh, involved, then the proofs that you get from such switchable formulas are only built from additive synthetic inference rules. Okay, so again, we're now back to additive, but with much, much more expressive connectives. And here's an example of, um, of uh, how a proof would run. If you really want to go through the, this, I'll let you look at it on your own. Simulate to sim, you unfold the definition of sim, you get this. Then you do the introduction rules. So you have uh, two eigenvariables and an assumption. Uh, then you you get rid of this assumption that causes the creation of lots and lots of cases. 
then I get to this place that's uh, I've stored it, I focus, okay, and now, uh, and then at this point I have to introduce some clever information, what, what would the continuation for that uh, look like under the A1 action, okay. But then I'd be back to proving sim simulation again. So that's an example of uh, only additive inference rules, although in the middle there is multiplicative rules going on. Some applications, this is uh, the strategy of proof search in the setting has been built into the Bedverse system. And the Abella theorem prover is based on lots of these ideas, although it's not an automated system. What I'm describing was designed for automation. Uh, and we've used this notion in the paper that I mentioned earlier to talk about reachability, proof certificates for reachability, for non-reachability, uh, for bi-simulation and for non-bi-simulation. I mean, these are all well-known things in the past, but it's nice to see that the, the proof theory predicts exactly these uh, structures could be proof certificates. In other words, they describe proofs. So in conclusion, multiplicative additive linear logic plus the connectives for first order logic provides a natural setting for many model checking queries. The additive connectives, additive connectives have a clear relationship to model checking, uh, but to be more expressive and finite theory, we have to allow uh, multiplicative rules, but we limit their use within additive synthetic uh, inference rules. And the proof theory of these switchable formulas in linear logic provides a foundation for model checking. Okay, with that, I finish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dale. Um, are there any questions? Please go ahead and raise your hand. We have a chance to clap after the question session, so I'll, I'll get everyone to unmute and <laughs> we'll thank Dale. Uh, Stepan, please go ahead. I'm just going to ask you to unmute. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you, Dale, for a great talk. I was just wondering how much will things get more complicated when you add some sort of induction? And which sort of induction would you wish to add? Some sort of circular proofs or some sort of structural mechanisms for induction could you suggest for? Them? Well, uh, I can. So a lot of what I've just described was, was meant to talk about finite exploration. OK. Uh, now. I, I have been looking with uh, other uh, colleagues and students at putting induction into the proof theory. So in fact, if you were to, to look at uh, David Bald's uh, uh, thesis, which I might, I, yeah, David Bald, you see his name here. Uh, he and, and uh, Ray McDowell and two, we have papers in which we talk about uh, adding induction and co-induction in, in this setting. So th these are the, uh, so we make these look like induction introduction rules. Uh, so introduction introducing the least fixed point on the left is actually an induction rule. So and you have to put in you have to invent the pre fixed point and stick it in right into the proof. Okay. And the greatest fixed points would be you do the, the same but on the in the dual sense. Okay. So these proofs would be such that you no longer have the subformula property, for example, but you can still talk about cut free and not cut free, but you don't have subformula properties. Now, it, uh, so we've been exploring that, and I think it's an interesting way to look at, say, arithmetic. So we know piano arithmetic is based on classical logic, Heitian arithmetic is based on intuitionistic logic. So we've recently been looking at well, what do we think about logic, arithmetic based on this linear logic, okay? So everything that described in this talk would fit into this linear, linearized version of arithmetic, but we could go much further than that. Now I've avoided um, circular proofs. I think uh, more clever people than me are dealing with that. So uh, what we've had for fixed points is when you have explicit invariance in the proof object itself. Okay, yeah, I see, I see. And what about uh, complexity? So what about this uh, small fragment of Mumol? Is this already undecidable or? Oh, yeah, it's easily undecidable. In fact, I mean, just uh, the, the business about purely positive fixed points. I mean, uh, in other words, purely positive fixed points, which is just one subset of this, is just one phase, if you will, can code an arbitrary prolog program and arbitrary prolog ah. programs are undecidable, yeah. Yeah, I see. So you, you actually have this B equals, uh, bank B, which gives you yeah. Contraction. Yeah, that's another way to say it. you'd expect it to be undecidable because you can reintroduce uh, contraction, if you will. 
what in a sort of restricted situation. Yeah, in a restricted yes. yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, Tom, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. And thanks there for the talk. Um, I, I wasn't aware of this uh, approach to equality that you mentioned. I think I understand why it's suitable for model checking, but I was wondering whether you could extend it to uh, equational theories, for example. It seems quite rigid, right? Yes, it is quite rigid. So, so it's, it's these rules here. So it's, it's a fairly old idea, like I mentioned back in the yeah. 91. Yeah. Um, so when I first saw it, I was excited partly because um, failure to unify, a failure of unification, say T equals S. If you try to unify them and they fail, you get a, a success of the proof. So, you know, if you're in prologue or pure prologue, horn clauses, failure means failure. You get a little failure, everything ends, or you have to, or you have to try a new path. But this was the first time I had seen a failure leads to a success. So that was exciting. And so this was, you know, a closed world assumption getting applied, okay, if you will. And that's one reason why it seems to work well in model checking. And I've become a real fan of it. Now, when it was proposed by uh, Schroeder Heister and Jean-Yves, it was uh, syntactic equality and no equations were allowed. Um, I also got excited because I knew what to do with unification, even if I had lambda terms involved, okay? And I had lots of applications of lambda terms, uh, uh, lambda expressions that I wanted to unify and use. So the, our very first um, applications of this in our own work was to add the, the equalities, if you will, of alpha, beta, and eta conversion on simple types, okay? And what you get is uh, you don't get most general unifiers anymore. You get complete sets of unifiers but the proof theory uh, was we could lift it to having to deal with complete set of unifiers. So I had imagined if you have a set of equations that you find particularly important, you can probably do something similar. That's something we didn't do in generality, but we did do it uh, by moving to lambda terms. Okay, I think uh, we're basically right on the hour. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get everybody to unmute and um, we can give Dell a, a round of applause. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I'll stop the recording now. Um, and.